right. All right, all right, all right. This is a Hellmare Nightscape. I'm starting my stream, getting on into it. You know, Heraclitus said, the same man can never step into the same stream twice, for he is not the same man, and it is not the same stream. Some words to reflect upon. This evening is 7 o'clock my time in the deep south central time zone. And it's nighttime in Minecraft world. I have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Welcome for anyone joining me um, or anyone watching this as a replay. As you can see, I've just got started with this world. Maybe a couple of you have seen this already. Haven't decorated this house, which is kind of doom and gloom. All this dark, all this darkness. Um, but I got some room to work with. May do some reorganization here. Added some, some item frames. Planted some crops. Been cutting down some trees and digging in the earth. Doing normal Minecraft stuff. Just checking now. What I'd like to do is grab that map off the wall and go out and do a little exploring. I still have the, uh, oh no, it's gone. I killed a, killed a party of pillagers not long ago, but I lost my little ominous, uh, you know, whatever that is, the curse that makes a, a raid happen if I go to a village. So I can go find a village now. That would be great. The other thing I really want to do, aside from finding a village, I don't have to do all this today, but I also want to go and... Um, Got to get diamonds soon. In fact, let's see. I can make I make a bit of a to-do list here. Give me some of this. Boom, boom. That's probably enough. So we'll put this over here. Where's a good place to do these? Maybe by the front door. One, two, three. Um, let's see. Find village slash um, fill out map. That's one thing. And then I also want to get diamonds slash obsidian slash enchantment. That's another big project to do. And then, oh yeah, I want to finish and decorate. That's not enough. House and art. That'll be an ongoing project, but that'll at least get me going. So I'll, I can do any of these right now. Um, so that's the Minecraft stuff. I'll grab this map, throw it in my offhand. Got a boat out here waiting for me. Um, the stuff that I'd like to talk about, you know, my goal with this uh, insane hobby that I've taken on, uh, which, you know, it's a hobby for me and a kind of silly one, but for a lot of people, uh, like streaming streaming video games and talking about bullshit is their, their source of income. It's just a crazy, crazy world we live in. But that's not the case for me. I have to do other things to make money, like have student loans and work shitty jobs and the like. And so I just do this for the hell of it. And it would be nice, I think, to talk a little bit about... Um, we talked about State and Revolution some yesterday, and I kind of dovetailed into... A little bit of talk about uh, Bernie Sanders and some parallels to Sanders and Karl Kautsky, or at least Karl Kautsky is portrayed uh, by Lenin and his well-known critiques of social democracy. But uh, I also spoke a little bit about some other related ideas, which are this sort of obsession, fixation upon image over reality. Um, and the, you know, that's one, and then the inability to comprehend imperialism as a stage of capitalism, which is obviously a very famous argument that Lenin made in his, his book, uh, you know, like, well, I guess book is the right word, it's not that long, um, it's like an extended pamphlet, um, which is called Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism. I think it was originally called imperialism the latest stage of capitalism or something like this and you know we changed we changed the title perhaps for obvious reasons um and you know social chauvinism which is the systematic 
privileging and, and preferring of the interest of the workers in the home country over the international proletariat, right, or the expense of workers abroad or at the expense of, um, you know, world, world um, how can I put this, I, I, Lenin is not a Trotskyist in this sense, I don't think, um, so I don't, one has to be careful when you start talking about worldwide socialist movements, but in a sense that I think is entirely, god damn it, I got I need another, really screwed up by not bringing a, I'm bringing some axes. I gotta get, I gotta get some cobblestone. Um, but but social chauvinism, just to get back to the rambling point, is a preference for the home country's workers over the the interest of the workers abroad. And I think you see this pretty clearly in. Ah, see, I left my bed too. I can kill some sheep. I think you see this pretty clearly in the Bernie Sanders movement, if that's what you want to call it. And um, you see it especially in the ideas on money that that camp espouses, most notably what's called modern monetary theory. And I think some of the problems that are raised in modern monetary theory mm -hmm. are also problems that stem from a tendency to believe that our problems you know, that we face under capitalism are primarily ideological or ideal um, or narrative in nature um, rather than seeing those sort of narrative frameworks, if that's what you want to call it, as an outgrowth of and perhaps a reinforcing, you know, a mutually reinforcing outgrowth, but nevertheless uh, um, as, as determined by underlying material conditions, which is sort of the classical Marxist materialist view on on ideology. And um, so I see MMT is committing sort of those two dual errors at one time. What do I mean by this? Well, so MMT, in, sorry, in addition to outright abandoning more obvious uh, tenets of classical Marxism, for better or for worse, not saying you have to believe something is true just because Marx believed it, but just to um, draw, that's not why I believe those sorts of things, for example, but just to sort of draw out the idea that, you know, MMT is not a Marxist theory of money or of the state. I think it's downright anti-Marxist, um, and I think that's pretty obvious, but you will find some MMT advocates who sort of tellingly uh, waffle on this position and are unable to say they don't they don't know Marx they don't know what he said about money and they don't know what he said about the state and so uh, you know at least that's my speculation and so they're unable to if you ask them you know point blank well how does this accord with Marx's thinking on the subject they can't answer that and they kind of know that it's a bad move as a leftist to say well this is you know not what Marx said this is actually goes against what Marx said so you can't really get them to do that either, even though that's pretty clearly what's going on. And uh, instead, what you usually get is, you know, like a link to a YouTube video. These people online who are MMT folks love to do that, or than anything else, um, which I guess is fine. But you should be able to defend your own ideas, even when they're complicated. That's actually how you come to better grasp these concepts is by defending them in conversation with, you know, when testing them against other ideas when you when you talk to people that disagree with you. And if you're not able to do that, then you've just relapsed into sort of the basis form of dogmatism, which is why I'm willing to talk about these subjects, because I'm not an expert on, on monetary theory. Uh, I've just read, and um, I can see the political implications and political uh, conditions for these different theories, but just because something has sound political implications doesn't mean it's, that, that has nothing to do with whether it's a sound theory itself, you know? Um, so MMT, I think, you know, divorces itself from Marxism in a pretty obvious way, but through its representatives, it is um, ashamed to admit this, it's, but at least they have sense to shame. Hey, Death Leopards, glad to see you join in the chat. I'm a... Uh, going to go out and gather some resources and try to flesh out this map a little bit. And I'm talking a little bit about MMT 
um, which I know is a very popular um, hobby horse of the the left these days. So if you have thoughts on that, you know, feel free to share them. I have a very negative view of that approach to fiscal and monetary policy. And I wanted to kind of link some of that stuff to, you know, my thoughts about money and what money is and how money is best understood um, and relate that to a broader discussion of how some of these ideas get taken up in contemporary left circles. And so I, I was, uh, to get back to sort of my, my rant here, um, I think that the basic tenet of modern monetary theory, which I've read a good bit about um, and have watched some of those YouTube videos that people have sent to me, is, uh, let, me let me put this crudely and naively, as Zizek would say, right? I'm not going to, let me leave out the caveats for now just to get the point across. The basic point is that a government like the U.S., and perhaps any government, can spend as much as it wants. Um, should not be concerned with balanced budgets, should look at um, the pro-austerity crowd as basically um, anti-scientific, anti-intellectual reactionaries, and uh, should, uh, when it, for example, wants to make policy changes that are best made through uh, an increase in the money supply or through um, through funding certain programs, right? They, print money, although we can come back to why that phrase is problematic in their mind, um, that the government is not constrained in any meaningful sense. At the margin, there are constraints, uh, they will say, although their acolytes may tellingly forget to uh, mention that part when they're summarizing MMT. Um, but, but making new money, digitally creating new money, putting it into social programs is the um, stock recommendation of the MMT crowd. Now, uh, and, and like I said, there's a lot of caveats here or extensions of this, but the main thing that it seems to me that the MMT folks are combating, which I think is worth combating, but is quite easily combated on other grounds, to be frank, is austerity. Austerity, of course, is this um, concept, uh, it's a fiscally conservative concept, that um, endorses the, you know, is, is very concerned with balanced budgets, let's say, but only in selective ways, for example, thinks that the best thing to do is to um, balance budgets by reducing social programs. So if you're entering a um, economic crisis, a crisis of overproduction in the Marxist terminology, um, a recession or a depression or a downturn in the bourgeois terminology, um, then, you know, the old, the sort of classical thinking on the, I mean, there's always been many branches of, of economics, so the, it's foolish to say there is one classical approach, but a classical approach to that situation would be, well, um, the government is making less in taxes now, uh, right, because incomes are down and people are laid off, etc., and therefore it needs to cut programs. Um, it's unable to cut some, say defense, et cetera, but it can cut others, say welfare spending. And so that's austerity in a nutshell. Um, and this was, um, you know, broadly speaking, sort of the thinking of the right wing in America prior to the time of the New Deal, for example. So if you go back to um, as you know, as you guys probably know, if you study this in history or in um, you know sociology classes or whatever, you you know what the New Deal is. It was a huge growth in government, uh, you know, welfare programs, essentially the birth of Social Security and things like that uh, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it's often sort of touted as a a form of socialism, although obviously it's not going to really meet, meet my definition, so to speak. Um, but it's also seen as um, a golden age to which we should return for a lot of the uh, push Biden left crowd, the sort of social Democrat crowd. So we could do another whole conversation sometime on why FDR is not someone that thinking leftists should be idolizing, right? Like this is um, very obvious. 
uh, and then that's not a hard case to make. But leaving that aside, there's this famous incident when I was teaching law classes to undergrads and uh, you know constitutional law and political science courses on the court system and stuff like that. Um, and prior to that, as a as a law student, as a political science grad student, we always discussed this uh, switch in time that saved nine, uh, which was FDR's. Well, and so the um, Supreme Court was striking down all the New Deal legislation, right? In a nutshell, and it was doing it under several um, constitutional uh, pre precedent lines of precedent. Um, a lot of what it was doing was striking down, um, well, so the Congress would pass a law claiming authority under the Commerce Clause, you know, that regulates interstate commerce. What is that down there? Something cool. And um, then the Supreme Court was narrowly, by today's standards, narrowly interpreting the Commerce Clause to say this or that thing is not actually in interstate commerce, it's produced purely within the state, or it's only labor, it's not, you know, a commodity, etc. And therefore, this is congressional overreach and tyranny, and uh, this New Deal program can cannot stand, we cannot abide it. And there were a few counter examples in there. Um, prior to 1937, I think it was, when the big switch occurred. But for the most part, the New Deal programs were getting kicked. Um, and uh, you know, so how, how does this relate to the overall theory that I'm trying to, to get into here? Well, eventually, Justice Roberts switched his uh, voting um, in favor of the um, uh, right wing of the court and instead allowed some of these New Deal programs to stand. And so after that, the, the federal government was able to start spending a lot in order to at least according to the way some people read history, and I see your comment there, Death Leopards, I'll, I'll respond to that in just a sec, uh, at least according to the way some people read history, to get us out of the Great Depression, which I didn't mention, but I'm sure you know was, was the major uh, thing going on at this time, aside from the rise of fascism in Europe, which was also a reaction in part to the devastation of the um, German economy following the First World War and you know the world repercussions of the Great Depression. Now, whether those programs actually got us out of the Depression is something I'm a little bit skeptical about. I think it was, you know, it's more complex than that, and it was really World War II was probably more of a factor. And that's a very, we, we would have to do another conversation on, on that point to sort of prove that up, and it's not like the New Deal did nothing. Um, but the folks who um, supported FDR uh, and still support FDR tended to and tend to embrace Keynesianism, right? John Maynard Keynes, a particular bourgeois, um, you know, some would say post-Marxist, but I don't think he has really any relation to Marx, um, um, economist, who said something very similar to what the MNT folks are saying now, which is you can spend into a deficit. You don't need to balance the budget. And in fact, when things are going south in your economy, when you're in a depression or a recession, a downturn of the, of the business cycle, as the, the industrialists call it, then you not only can you spend, but you definitely should spend. That's the only thing that will get us out. Um, so let me pause that for a moment, that conversation, and take a look here real quick at what Death Leopard said. So Death Leopard says, I think we should try to move away from monetary economic system, and MMT is the antithesis of that, also pulling leftists away from Marxism. I agree it's anti-Marxist and doesn't really address austerity. I, I mean, that's well put. That really is well put. Um, I don't think... Uh, I, I think your concerns come from a place that's very similar to you know, the place from which my concerns originate. Um, right, like actually wanting to move towards socialism, towards communism, and not wanting to base this on purely mon like on monetary policy. It seems like a totally bizarre way to b bizarre foundation for for socialism. Um, and I agree that it is, you know, obviously, you know, I agree it's anti-Marxist. Look, I was here before or something. There's a kelp floating around. Um, so yeah, I, I'm you know relieved in a way to hear we're, we're on the same page here because when I, you know, this is an aside, but this does matter for folks who like me recently and and maybe like other people who are watching this stream, um, which I'm going to post to YouTube by the way, 
uh, Death Leopards. I think I'm going to put these up on. It's so easy to download the VOD and then um, from Twitch and then put it up on YouTube so it'll just be up forever. Um, so I, I may do that. I put one video up. We'll see. It's just nice to have them there. But then again, I also say stupid shit. And I'm speaking very extemporaneously, so I may be, I may be really setting up a trap for myself. Um, so I don't know. I'm on the fence. If you have any thoughts about that, let me know. They they disappear off of Twitch for two weeks, but you can put them up on YouTube forever, and it's free. You can pay for 90 days on Twitch, but I'm not trying to pay Twitch any money. Um, but anyways, the. Um, the MMT, so maybe, uh, let's see, this is such a complex subject. The, this one sort of miniature point I was trying to make there is that the MMT folks online, on Twitter specifically, are, um, I'm, I, I'm with, I want to say batshit fucking crazy. Like, that's the term that comes to mind, but I know that's, you know, problematic language. Because uh, I'm also myself batshit crazy, but not quite in that way. And because that's, you know, obviously doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't really aid the conversation any to just sling insults, although it's, it certainly is gratifying. Oh no, I fell down. I'm glad I didn't just die right then. All right, let me get back out of here. That's why I brought this dirt <laughs> for just such an occasion. Um, so I uh, have interacted with them. They have like a cult bot type of behavior, like a swarm behavior. I know for a fact, well, I can't say I know for a fact, there's strong evidence that there are MMT people online, modern monetary people online, who are just scanning the hashtag MMT, uh, you know, results every day and then, and then intervening in conversations based on that, which is, ah, I wish I had, I should have bought, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to give me a dog. Come on, I hope one of these works. Um... They're, they're scanning the MMT hashtag and then just, like, group responding to anyone who, yeah, all right, come with me. Now I can breed some. Uh, to anyone who disagrees with them. And I know because I've made the mistake of using uh, MMT hashtag or even just MMT. Yes, exactly. Death Leopards has called out the, the cult leader. Um, he's not the only one, but yes, that is exactly the person I have in mind, Steve Grumbine. Which sounds like a Dickens character to me. Like, that doesn't sound like a real person's name. That sounds like a made-up name. There's another one named Tankus. So Grumbine and Tankus. Although I think Tankus is a bit more intellectual. And Grumbine is... Grumbine? I don't I don't know how to say his name. I, I've interacted with him a few times when I was first trying to learn about MMT. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's... Look, I don't use the word grift. I think that's like poison... That's like online poison language. Um, you know, if other people want to use it, it's fine. It's just I see that word thrown around so much, uh, and it seems to shut down conversation, so I don't ever use it. But if I were going to use it, uh, you know, I could think of no clear example. I'll put it that way. This is someone who is trying to build an online brand, the, the real progressives. I've heard, you know, I guess I shouldn't use hearsay and smear tactics, but I, I don't have evidence that his sort of uh, treatment of the folks that he, quote, collaborates with, who are really sort of his workers, um, have always been treated fairly. But I can't, you know, take take my ambiguous and vague um, gossip there with a grain of salt. You shouldn't really put a lot of stock when someone says that without citation. I can't really cite the folks who have told me that for, like, to protect their anonymity. Um, so dismiss that if you if you like. That would be fair. But the, the single-minded focus on... MMT is a little bit troubling to me, and the fact that it's coupled with this, you know, quote, progressive language, which I think anyone who's, you know, anyone who's spent any time on my, uh, on my Twitter stream, I'm all full up, or well, I'm not quite full, um, knows that I'm not, like, a huge fan of that, that, uh, what the fuck is going on down there? I don't know what that thing is. Um... Not a huge fan of that label, progressive. I think it's, you know, it falls victim to a lot of the stuff I was just saying. Like, you know, you should be careful listening to people who use ambiguous and very online terms. Yeah, I think progressive is is one of those, and I don't um, think it has any content really. So the fact that he's doing this MMT thing, this progressive thing, I think he was a big Bernie supporter, and you guys know my views on Bernie. Again, I'm someone who. Voted for Bernie, but who 
in the primaries in 2016, and who had his eye on him before that. But now I've come to see, you know, I just embrace the sort of sheepdogging, um, social chauvinist theories of Sanders. And so people who use progressive as a self-identifier who are still on board with Sanders, although I, maybe he's not, I don't, I don't really follow Grumbine enough to know if that's true or not, um, but I think it is. And, you know, who, who not only are progressive, quote, but also MMT folks, all of that is red flags, or, or I guess absence of commie red flags. That's all danger signs, um, in my view. Um, and so the MMT um, online behavior, I should add to one other thing. I mean, this isn't, this is not me building the case against MMT. This is just sort of uh, other things I've noticed that tend to sort of just turn me off in general. But you shouldn't reject MMT on account of its followers behaving, you know, out of hand. Maybe they're just very passionate, but like, that's fine, whatever. But the reasons, and, and the, the reason to be concerned about the online sort of hordes of MMT folks, though, are that I don't think they really understand the theory. I've often said, okay, here's my objections to MMT. Um, what do you what do you make of these? You know, advocates, online accounts, small small account with a thousand followers. Um, what do you make of these? Do you find them compelling or not? And time and time again, I've had one of three things happen. One, ignore the criticisms, just entirely ignore them. Um, two, say they don't like my tone, which maybe my tone is out of pocket or maybe it's not, I don't know, but tone policing when asked a substantive question is another thing that's going to make me lower my estimation of your intellect. Or three, they, um, they like just at some quote unquote expert, right? Like, oh, here, Stephanie Kelton, uh, can, can explain this to you or Steve Grumbine or whatever. And it's like, no, you're the one, um, and I've had big accounts. I had Anthony Zankus do, do these. He sent me a fucking TED Talk. It was like an absurd thing to do to a communist. Um, it was a TED Talk on nonviolence when I asked him about MMT. Like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? So I lost a lot of respect for that guy um, <clears throat> as a result. And so I don't um, think it's really silly of me to ask people who are propagating this idea um, that I think is a false one and a, a reactionary and backwards leading one to give the reasons for their adherence to this view. Like that doesn't seem like a crazy, is that a crazy thing for me to ask? It doesn't seem like it. it seems like exactly what you should, you know, that's like how discourse works. Oh, you believe this? I don't. Here are my objections. Here's how I understand the thing that you, uh, that you like, you know, am I misunderstanding it or are my objections um, you know, go, go off the mark. Uh, let's talk about this. Let's not just tone police and call each other names. And I can't get that, really. Um, I can't say never. There are some people who talk about an MT and they're quite intelligent. Um, they're well read. I think they're mistaken on some fundamentals. They're, uh, those sorts of people are going to tell you nine times out of ten, they're going to tell you this is not um, a Marxist theory of mine. They may say it's neutral, or they may sort of dodge the question a little bit, but they're not going to, tr they, if they understand it enough to, you know, sort of actually enter into a dialogue, <laughs> to use liberal speak on this, then they're not going to pretend that it's a Marxist theory. Most people, though, that you encounter will retweet MMT, and they'll say, they put, they say, this isn't a theory, this is objective fact. If you disagree with this, it's like disagreeing with gravity. Okay, so I've said enough about the, the sort of acolytes, but those same people also don't understand that even within MMT, there are constraints on the spending power of the government, and there are um, constraints on the applicability of the model which lacks a lot of empirical support. A lot of economic theories lack empirical support. MMT is no different. It is not well supported empirically. You can find a recent thread I did on Twitter where there's an article, you know, an academic article outlining the sort of limited empirical nature of MMT. Um, and so your dogmatic acolytes do a lot of harm to the theory or at least reveal the sort of flaccid nature of the theory, in my opinion.
that's guilt by association to some degree. I'm making a point really there about the reception of the theory, not the theory itself. And so if your reaction to that is, well, it doesn't make it untrue that, you know, foolish people believe it. Um, it doesn't make it untrue that people are unable to defend this idea that, you know, the one person or one group of people's inability to defend an idea doesn't mean the idea is indefensible. I think you're totally right. So that I'm, I'm talking about the way this is taken up in online circles and building a case on that. This is still not rejecting the theory. Now let me turn to another part that is not quite rejecting the theory either, but I, I spoke about a little bit before, which is let me show just a few ways that MMT is incompatible with Marxism. And so again, the, this may sound like I'm saying, well, Mar everything Marx said was right. And so if you disagree with Marx, you're wrong, which isn't really my view. And we could later talk about some of the stuff that, you know, I don't think Marx expressed in the best way or that has been problematically interpreted by subsequent Marxists. Um, there's definitely some of that stuff. And it may be my reading of Marx is bad, or it may be that he was writing rhetorically, or maybe that he was just, you know, and so I shouldn't take it out of context, or it may just be that he was wrong. All of those are possibilities. Um, but this, this critique of MMT that I'd like to transition into now, and this is hard to do extemporaneously while you're exploring a snow world, by the way, um, it is a, is just to shore up that point I made earlier, which is MMT is not a Marxism, right? And so I think there are two, there's a bunch of examples, but let me just point out two really obvious ones um, that, is this death? Nope, it's not too bad. Um, that make it so that you can't believe Marxism in its sort of classical, or I shouldn't even say Marxism, we should be clear here. Marx's understanding of uh, money and how it functions in a capitalist system as demonstrated by you know numerous texts, but including capital. Um, these uh, two points are the labor theory of value and the commodity theory of money. Now, like I said, I think there are other conflicts between Marxism and, uh, well, actually, let me add another one, because it is worth talking about, the, the revolutionary nature of Marxism and the agnostic, neutral, or anti-revolutionary nature of MMT. Um, so there are other aspects of Marxism you could probably oppose to MMT. There are certainly aspects of Marxism-Leninism that you could oppose, um, and there are points of alignment as well, where you could say, well, you know, Marx and uh, Steve Grumbine are actually on the same page. This is true. Um, it's not every, not every single thing, and there are even some good things about MMT, although I think they're, most of the good things, Jesus, uh, most of the good things are, have already been said by other folks before, or are sort of blown out of proportion, so I don't think there's like a ton of value there, but I don't disagree with every single point that every MMT theorist would make. Some of it's obvious, some of it's, uh, some of it's fine, uh, a lot, but context is everything. So what's the labor theory of value? Uh, come on, goats, don't headbutt me. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't headbutt me off the side there. That would have been a horrible way to end this. Um, God, look, I've run into those guys I don't know, six or eight times, every time I'm out exploring the world, I see the raiding party, like every single time. Um, I've only killed them once. But the uh, labor theory of value is, I think, foundational to Marxism. And I'm sort of shocked when I see someone who purports to be a Marxist, but who rejects this framework for understanding value. And I don't think it's, uh, I, I try not to be dogmatic because you can, like, I, it's a way of understanding uh, the way value is expressed in under capitalism. That's what the labor theory of value is. It's not the only theory um, about how money works. And it is opposed to some theories and perhaps it's neutral with regards to others as the MMT folks would, would have us believe it is to, to MMT perhaps. Um, but you could you could talk about other theories of value that are um, useful as well. I, so I'm not saying like this is this is it. You know, this is the only way to ever think about value. But I do think it's a pretty useful one. And in fact, I think it's the most useful one 
um, descriptively and analytically, and not only because I like you know the political implications it has, but because I think it helps you to understand how capitalism works, which is to say how the world we actually live in these days works, which is kind of like what attracts me to Marxism more than anything else is its scientific nature and explanatory power. And so the labor theory of value says that, well, you know, you could do this at a, a many levels of complexity, but there are two basic types of value under Marxist thinking. There's use value and there's exchange value, which Marx sometimes simply calls value. Now, whether this is all value in a society, I think, you know, is a point that some have disputed or, you know, had, had conversations about. But I, I think we're talking about economic value here. You could say, oh, I value my, um, my, my tennis shoes I wore during that basketball game where I took the winning shot. I value them really highly. Or I value my friendships with my family. Or, you know, my values are loyalty and honesty and integrity. Um, the sort of, you know, that those are not exactly the, the meaning of value that Marx is getting at here. He's talking about exchange value and use value. Now, there are relations between all these different um, uses of the word value, and maybe there's more overlap than I'm sort of letting on at this particular point. But let's not act like, uh, at least just for the sake of this conversation, this is a comprehensive theory of value in the way that like, you know, Nietzsche or someone like that might might want to offer a, a more, um, like to talk about uh, value to core, as they say, you know, full stop. Instead, we're talking about worth, right? Market, the, the worth of something um, to a human being and how that's expressed through market relations. And so a use value is something that uh, an object has, a good has, without any relation to other um, commodities. So the use value of an apple might be that it satisfies hunger and, you know, has caloric intake, you know, caloric um, value, gosh, there I use it again, has, um, has calories, is calorie bearing so that if you eat it, it will sustain life, right? That's its use. The use value of a hammer is that it, um, you know, puts nail, drives nails into wood. Uh, it has other uses as well, but there's a value associated with, you know, like you crack somebody's skull open with it or something, right? Kill a, kill a bug, overkill a bug. Um, but these uh, use values are the reason that we need things, right? We, we need an apple or we need some food because we need it to live. They satisfy human needs or wants or desires. Um, and then, but, but use value is not um, immediately represented in the market. If, oh, did I leave my boat somewhere? I must have. Probably back there. Oh, well, I don't care, actually. Um, instead, in the marketplace, what we, and by marketplace, I mean, you know, civil society where we exchange goods, that sort of stuff, um, we encounter not pure use values, but rather, we, in order to get at the use value, we encounter exchange values. And what is an exchange value? Well, an exchange value is the um, number of commodity A that can be exchanged for commodity B. Right? If you have a uh, hundred rolls of linen, and these can be exchanged for ten coats, then you have uh, an equation you can set up there: one hundred linen equals ten coats, or ten coats equals one hundred linen. And uh, you know, linen like not uh, not Vladimir Ilyich, but rather the the fabric, obviously. And so that ratio, um, if you if you understand that ratio between different commodities then you understand what exchange value is, right? It's one commodity's value expressed in a quantity of another commodity. And so there's actually a thing that gives value to those differing commodities, right? If we talk about abstract value, <clears throat> right? Do you have a coat has nothing, is not the same as a roll of linen. Those are two metaphysically distinct entities. They have different attributes. You can't mistake one for the other. Um, and yet they are, despite being totally different, they are also equivalent in some sense. And so the philosopher Marx can't help but you know pose this as a riddle, 
you know, in, in that way, um, and say, well, what is it then that allows this equivalence? Like, how can you exchange one for the other, right, which demonstrates an equivalence of two things that are ostensibly on their face, intuitively um, incommensurate, but incommensurable, right, not, not able to be equated. Not equal, but equal. How do you do that? And so there must be some underlying stratum that is abstract uh, value here, right? And so what is it? Well, Marx, in, in capital, but also this is, it's not like he's inventing this, uh, although he is doing a lot more work with it than some of the previous political economists did. Marx has that underlying um, stratum, that underlying substance, if you like, in the, in the sort of metaphysical sense, is labor, right? It's human time is what it really is. It's useful labor, socially necessary. Hey, there's my house. Uh, look how pretty it looks from here. Um, it needs to have some roof, roof work done. Um, but socially um, necessary labor time. Literally, the amount of someone's life uh, that was given up to, to go into the production of this good so that it can be um, metabolized or, or instrumentalized as a use value by you or me, right? That's what value is. So the in this very simple, very abstract way, the thing that is um, allowing the 10 coats to equal the 100 rolls of linen is the amount of time that was put into and again, this is in a very abstract way, the amount of socially necessary labor time that was put into creating the 100 rolls of lib lib linen is equivalent to the amount of labor, right? Not wasted labor, not uh, meandering or, or hyper fast labor, but socially necessary uniform abstract labor that was put into making the other commodity, uh, the, the tin coats, I think was the other one. And so, you have an equivalency of labor, and this is, I guess, the point to transition into the labor theory of value, right? So what is it that gives value to these objects? In case it's not obvious here, it is, well, I got a little bit of that explored, a bunch more to do. It is labor. I find this theory compelling. There's a number of reasons, but to, to me, the reason the, that overrides all the others, that really makes me say, oh, I think this is the way to think about labor in our society, is that unlike alternative theories of value, which really I think are theories of price, and we could talk about that another day, but unlike what the bourgeois economists say, um, the, the, who, who say that value is uh, determined by subjective desire, right? Supply and demand and, and scarcity and uh, increases at the margin. Um, that is, oh, hello, uh, welcome Darkwater Douglas. Uh, what a pleasure to see you here. Um, uh, I was just <laughs> going into a bit of a diatribe about MMT and taking a long diversion into the labor theory of value. Um, which I'll do for another 15 minutes or so. The reason I like the labor theory of value and find it compelling is that it provides an account of the mechanism of production of value. So instead of simply saying, well, why does this or that thing have value? Oh, well, because someone values it, right? Or why does this thing or that thing have value? Well, because it's uh, you know scarce but still um, desired. Uh, or because, you know, the supply and demand curve meet here. Those, those are, um, some of those are outright tautologies, right? Like they don't add any, they're just um, self-referential. It's just begging the question. It's uh, answering the question with a reformulation of the question. Why does it have value? Because it has value. Pretty, um, pretty unpersuasive if you ask me. But even in the best case scenario where you say, well, people have subjective beliefs and uh, those are expressed in the market, you're not explaining the way that value was put into this object. Whereas if you talk about a, an objectification, right, a rendering into an object of time through the mechanism of human labor, right, you, you have hours of the day and you have a physical body, you, you, you use your physical body during a certain segment 
of of daylight. Um, you know, d during a certain segment of, of the um, clock time, and as a result of that material, observable, empirical process, a thing gains value. Um, you know, that to me is a very compelling theory of the origin and nature of value. Sorry for the... <laughs> My menagerie here is loud as hell. But I gotta get that leather in, you know? Can't... You gotta give me some bookshelves? Give me some item frames? I'll do the Minecraft thing. So sorry for the noise. I hope that does it. You see what I'm doing right now, right? I'm creating value here. That's right, I'm going meta. I'm creating a little leather product, my little co commodities, through an actual process, right? Like, I'm doing something. It's not just that I'm believing or feeling something. It's that I'm doing something. And so value, in that sense, is created, um, you know, empirically, observably, materially. The bourgeois economists don't allow this... Um, despite all their claims about empiricism, look at that beautiful jungle tree, um, they're not actually empirical when it comes to the production of value. So that's one reason that I think the labor theory of value is really useful. Now, will you find any of that at all in MMT? No, absolutely not. They don't believe that, they don't believe in the labor theory of value, they don't believe money um, is a commodity, which is something we could talk about, you know, in just a sec, but instead they believe that to the extent money has anything to do with value, it's something that's created by states. Now you must see, right, if you are at all inclined towards Marxism, uh, you must see the difference between a theory of value that says the state creates value and a theory of value that says the working class creates value. That is like a, about as stark a contrast as you can get. So do you see now maybe at least a little bit why I may not be a big fan uh, of the political implications of MMT. State makes a value versus workers make value. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so the rejection of the labor theory of value, I think, is misguided because I, I think I hopefully have explained a little bit of why I find it compelling just as, a, just as an explanation of what's actually going on. And you, I've hinted at why it's maybe a little bit of an anti-Marxist position just in its political ramifications, right? State good versus workers good. Um, and the commodity theory of value is the other thing that's worth mentioning here. Um, and, you know, forgive me if I'm not getting all of this, if I'm not stating it in the best way, or if I'm rambling a bit, this, these are, you know, I don't have any notes. I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head. And it's, it, these are, um, I think some people find these very difficult concepts, and I don't pretend to have mastered them. The commodity theory of money is one of those that's extremely difficult to get a grasp on because we live in the United States in 2022, and the idea that money is gold strikes us as extremely alien and off putting. Um, in Marx's time, this was more intuitive, and of course, you know, the United States officially moved off of the gold standard in the middle of the 20th century, and, you know, by all agreement, we do have a form of fiat currency now, which is just like sort of state-backed rather than commodity-backed currency. Um, but to say, but to wholly reject, so there is um, plenty of reason to be misled here is my point for saying that. But to wholly reject the commodity theory of money um, is to really embrace a very extreme version of MMT, a very simplistic version, that I don't think it's more... Um, I'm not sure that it's better educated progenitors, you know, the UN Kansas City folks and, and uh, Ray and Kelton and all these, like, uh, MMT economists. I don't... I don't I think they would be cautious in a way that their online, um, their online followers are not so cautious. But they, um, although perhaps not for exactly the reasons I'm about to outline. But if money, so currency is different than money, right? Like money is the underlying thing which currency represents. The commodity theory of money flows out of that theory of exchange value that I was giving a synopsis of a, a moment ago, which depends on the labor theory of value. 
And it, you know, simply highlights the fact that under, I'm going to leave this tree up, I think it's pretty, under the development, you know, under the conditions um, by which money developed, um, com certain commodities were exchanged for one another until um, com a particular commodity, because of its characteristics, like it was durable and divisible and scarce and had limited applications, in other words, commodities like gold or silver, um, and, and gold's a better example than silver because it's, you know, more scarce and leaving aside sort of, um, you know, uh, computer applications and, and jewelry, it has relatively limited applications compared to something like iron, you know, um, that this commodity, this divisible, um, durable substance could eventually become a special commodity that would serve as the universal medium of all exchange value, right? So it, it takes on the use value of representing exchange values, right? Gold has use value in that you can make a watch out of it or something like that, um, or jewelry, but it, as money, has a use value of representing all other values, all other exchange values. And, you, you know, this kind of makes sense. Um, the MMT folks have a different story than Marx does about the uh, historical um, development of money. They, they always link it to, they reject an emergence of money out of bartering and always link it to states. And so there is uh, an empirical historical debate to be had there. I'm more persuaded by the Marxist side, but I at least appreciate this aspect of MMT that actually does try to grapple a little bit with history instead of just being purely um, abstract as it tends to be. But the, um, you know, if you have a bunch of apples, you're an apple farmer, you're producing a commodity. And what is a commodity, by the way? A commodity is something that is produced, I think I said I was going to leave this tree instead now. A commodity is something that's produced not for its use value directly, but rather for its exchange value. That is, uh, in a nutshell, what Marx means when he says commodity, right? So if you produce an apple in your backyard, and uh, you know, you're not a capitalist, you're not taking it to the market to sell it in exchange for money, then, and you're just keeping it because you want to bake a pie with it and eat it or something like that, then you, you know, you're not producing a commodity. And this is a, just sort of a silly thought experiment, right? Under capitalism, we're all more or less producing commodities. The social system does matter here. But just to, just to intellectually draw the distinction, um, under social systems where production is immediately for use value rather than for exchange value, you're not producing a commodity. If you are producing a commodity, you're producing something to exchange. Well, if you produce apples, apples rot. You can't have a big storehouse full of a whole bunch of apples that you're going to keep, like a bank account, for years and, you know, be able to express your wealth in apples. If you want to barter apples with the iron salesman up the street, you're going to have trouble because you need to get rid of those apples real quick. It's not a very good uh, mechanism of exchange. But the iron guy is in a better position, and you can find societies where iron has been used to make coins, for example, uh, uses money. Um, and so other metals also work really well as money. But other things do too. You know, salt could work, but it's too plentiful and it's too many use values. Um, etc. Um, shells, right? There's, there are other things you can come up with, but gold is a really good one. So gold remains a commodity. It's produced by human labor. It's in the earth and we take it out, right? That's the, the labor that goes into gold is not uh, in its, it's in its extraction, right? Not in its uh, manufacture, obviously. But human labor goes into it. In fact, a tremendous amount of human labor for a very small amount of gold. Another thing that makes it a suitable um, uh, money. And as a result of its special qualities, over the centuries, gold became sort of the definition of a money while still remaining a commodity. MMT rejects this theory from, from start to finish, it rejects everything that I just told you about, the development of commodities and the development of money. Um, there are 
plenty of lectures on YouTube as we sort of lie, uh, wrap, wrap up here. I didn't get through everything I'd like to say because it's a uh, it's a complicated subject. Also, I guess this is boring just watching me break down all this stuff, but I wanted to put a big... Uh, I'm going to turn all this into farmland, at least in the short term, so I can do wheat. I wanted to find a village so I can get some potatoes and carrots, and obviously so I can get some mending and whatever going. Um, and I'll, I'll come back maybe and talk a little bit more about uh, MMT some more tomorrow, since I thought it was advisable to spend at least a little bit of time explaining the Marxist position here and why I find it compelling before attacking, you know, or I, I did a little bit of that too, but before fully uh, demonstrating why I have such disagreement with the MMT theory. So to sort of summarize what we managed to do today, we fleshed out a little bit of our Minecraft map. Um, I showed off my house, which is still in, incomplete. You know, it's an unfinished state. I uh, cleared a little bit of farmland here at the end. We gathered some crops. I used my labor to produce value by feeding those cows over there. And in terms of what we talked about, we put a pin in the state and revolution discussion. And, uh, oh, thank you, Death Leopard. Yeah, I'll post these vods on YouTube. Shout out to you. I, I really, really enjoy having you here. You know, I know you're not going to be able to make it every time, but it does brighten my day when I, when I see you. And, um, you know, you're a big part of this for me. Actually, it's a lot of, uh, it, it's, it, it, it psychs me up some to know that every once in a while, or at least, you know, quite often, someone is paying attention to this. Um, that makes this a lot easier and more enjoyable for me, although I would do it anyways. Um, but the uh, state and revolution discussion, we can come back to at a future time. This discussion about social chauvinism and social democracy, I think, is common to both the MMT discussion and the, um, and the sort of Sanders discussion I had the other day. And I didn't get to spend enough time talking about the sort of superficial and uh, spectacle and simulacrum uh, nature of some of this stuff that dovetails with our discussion of, of intelligence and security state operations. But maybe we can find a way to fit all that together. And uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I, I Look, I think the Minecraft is really fun. Death Leopards is just giving another generous comment here in the chat. Uh, I... You know, I, I like to talk. Um, it, I would probably find a way to do this by myself if it weren't, um, you know, possible with our technology now to do it with, with some friends and comrades. I'll do a plug. If you find me on Twitter, you want to read uh, Capital with us. We're starting um, a project with a, a small group of us who will probably be meeting, you know, once a week or twice a month or something like that and have a Discord and maybe do a live Zoom link and take off or, you know, um, a Zoom session and take off little chunks of capital, maybe a section at a time or 10 or 20 pages at a time to tackle that very complex material. I haven't read it in quite a while. Some sections I've read a lot. Some sections I'm very unfamiliar with. Um, but I think it's sort of our duty as, as leftist to uh, to spend some time with that amazing text. So please feel free to share that idea with anyone that you think might be interested and I will for sure be talking more about capital in this stream since that's something that'll be on my mind. So we'll circle back around to all of this. I'm going to sign off now. Uh, thank you guys and uh, hope you're all staying safe and happy. See you next time.